All right. So in Genesis chapter 40, of course, uh, just a, a small recap to where we're at in the book of Genesis. We're, we're into the story of Joseph now. Joseph has been sold into slavery by his brothers. His brothers were envious of him. They didn't like the fact that he was the father's favorite. They, they, you know, he had these dreams that he was going to be ruling over his whole family, and his brothers didn't like that. And they said, here comes this dreamer. We'll see what's going to become of his dreams. And they were going to kill him. They ended up selling him to the Ishmaelites. And then he goes into Egypt, and this man Potiphar buys him. Potiphar is the, the chief, um, the captain of the guard for Pharaoh. And he, Joseph becomes his servant. And basically, God blesses him, and everything that he does is going real well. And this man Potiphar basically makes Joseph the second in command of his whole house, of everything that he has. And he's, he's kind of running all the business and everything that's going on in the house until Potiphar's wife tries to entice him to commit adultery. Joseph says no. He runs out, but she lies about him. And of course, now he's thrown into prison. And this is where we're at now. So Joseph's in prison. Then basically all of chapter 40, we just read the whole chapter, but it all covers, it's all centralized around these two men, the butler and the baker. And we're missing the candlestick maker, but we got the butler and the baker. But we've got these two men, they have their dreams, and Joseph interprets them to him. And this is the whole story that goes on in chapter 40. So that's going to be what most of the teaching revolves around. I may not hit every single verse because we've already read them all. But I want to point out something here. Let's get started in the beginning of the chapter here. Just as just a little overview to give you a recap of where we're at in Genesis chapter 40 and what's been going on in the life of Joseph. Verse number one says, And it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king. So he... The Pharaoh gets mad at these guys for whatever reason. We don't know. And he casts them into prison. And um, verse 2 says, And Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. And he put them in ward in the house of the captain of the guard into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. So he sends these people to the same prison where Joseph is. But what I want to point out here, which is, is somewhat interesting, I didn't really go into this very much in the previous chapter, is verse 3 says he put them in ward in the house of the captain of the guard. Sarah, come here. Now, I don't know exactly the position that that is, but a captain, there's usually only like one cat, like you have a captain of a police force, you have a captain of something, that's like a position that's there's only like one of those, right? And a guard, the captain of a guard would be some type of a protective type of service, right? We have the, the national guard, right? It's something that guards are supposed to be the what we have as troops in the United States to be guarding against foreign invaders. That would be supposed to be what the National Guard's duties are. Now, obviously, they send them off to war just like everybody else, but that's a whole other story. I'm not going to get into all that tonight. Um, we see here, he sends him to the house of the captain of the guard, which is where the prison is actually located. And this prison specifically is for f the king's prisoners. It's not the general population prison. This is only for prisoners that, have, that, that were you know, working for or more in closely with people in these positions of power under the king. It's, it's a different type of a prison. And we get that from, go back to Genesis 39 in um, verse number 1, we see, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard. So Potiphar, the man that bought Joseph, is this captain of the guard. That's the position that he holds. And I don't believe, I've, I've seen someone you know, um, I've heard someone say that, you know, the captain of guard is just like a sheriff, like you have all these sheriffs, and, and that, that doesn't even make any sense because we don't have a whole bunch of sheriffs. We have one sheriff, and we have a bunch of sheriff's deputies that go out and do this other stuff, right? So, like, I, I believe that the captain of the guard, there's one captain of the guard, and this is Potiphar. And Potiphar has this prison basically in his house. Now, as I mentioned last week, his house is probably, he's, he's probably got a pretty big house. He seems to be, you know, being a captain of the guard is a relatively good position. He has the wealth and the resources to be able to buy a slave. He buys Joseph and he has a need for a slave too, to be able to run whatever it is that's going on in his house. He has a prison and he has, which I mean, probably the prison is since he's the captain of the guard, it would probably make sense that he has this, this facility in order to hold prisoners as someone who's got kind of a, a defensive type of a service, you know, a guardsman, policeman, what have you. He's got this jail located somewhere within the confines of his house. And um, 
But we see here the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, in verse number 1, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. So Potiphar is the captain of the guard that we saw from Genesis 40, um, where the prison's located. And then look at verse number 20. Jump down to verse number 20 in chapter 39. This is after all that stuff happens with Potiphar's wife, you know, falsely accusing him. It says, And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. He was there in prison. See, that's, and that's where it specifies that prison that Joseph's in is the is this special prison for the king's prisoners. And that's also why then we see the butler and the baker being cast into this prison because it's specifically for the king's prison. Now, I don't know all the reasons why they would have it separate. Maybe because if you're working for the king, you've got like access to, to more things that, that other people, especially other criminals, might want to know. And if they just throw you into prison with other, with other criminals, maybe you'd leak some type of information that you shouldn't be leaking that, that you know, about the security of, of Pharaoh or whatever. I don't know. But um, it, it basically had this special place. And um, we saw in verse 21 then, the Lord was with jo Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. So Potiphar had, of course, someone who was keeping the prison house. And before Joseph was thrown in prison, Joseph was basically running over everything. So Joseph would have been in charge even over the keeper of the prison prior to himself being thrown into this prison because it was part of, Joseph, or it was part of Potiphar's house. If that makes sense. So that, that may also be one of the reasons why, you know, we know obviously God was with him and God was making sure that he was being protected. And God showed favor in his sight. But it's also not that hard to believe that Joseph was probably a very good leader and a very good boss. So with this keeper of the prison, he probably didn't do anything to upset him or, you know, in, in, in the course of his duties, he was probably being a really good boss so that when he gets thrown in there, you know, the keeper of the prison probably knows what's going on anyways and knows that Joseph's innocent because Joseph was completely innocent here and he had nothing to do. And even when we get to chapter 40, we see in, look at verse number four. Now we're, we're done with 39. Go back to, to chapter 40. It says in verse 4, And the captain of the guard, which is Potiphar, right, charged Joseph with them, and he served them, and they continued to seize and ward. So the Potiphar had to do something with Joseph. And I mentioned this last week, so I'm not going to go into very much detail. But basically, he's in a position where either he has to call his wife a liar, you know, and basically slander his own house and his own name because his wife is just making stuff up, or he has to punish Joseph. And I believe, I believe, and again, I'm not very dogmatic about this, but I think Potiphar probably knew, or at least was under the assumption that maybe his wife was lying. Now, and again, he puts him in prison. It's not like he was put to death because he didn't actually do anything. It was supposedly something he attempted to do, but, but ran away. And the story's kind of fishy, but he had to do something. In order for him to just save face, he has to be like, okay, well, Joseph's going to prison. But we see here he doesn't seem to have any problems with Joseph running the prison house because the keeper of the prison basically put Joseph in charge of running everything when he was in there. And that's one of the ways that God blessed him while he was in prison. He still had all these extra, he had these duties to do and was kind of in charge of that prison. Even though he was still bound in the prison to one, you know, at one degree, he was the one going around here and it said he was charged with serving them. So he served the butler. You know, obviously they have to eat and, and do things. So he's the guy going around from cell to cell, you know, giving them their food and doing everything that needs to be done in the prison. And um, because we even see Potiphar coming then and charging Joseph with them and not being like, what are you doing out here? You know, you need to be locked up and coming down real hard on them. To me, it's just another indicator that he probably realizes that, that he was just in a position, but his wife was probably lying about it. But, um, you know, obviously we don't know that for sure. That's just what I think, but it's kind of interesting that, that when, you, when you read this really closely and you, and you see these terms being used, like the captain of the guard, well, that's Potiphar. We got that from chapter 39. But let's keep reading here. Because that's not the meat of this, of this uh, chapter at all. It's just kind of a side note more than anything. So he's charged to, to watch over these guys because they're prisoners there. And it says in verse 4, um, 
And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, and they continued a season in ward. So they're in, they're in jail for a while. I believe that when, it, when the Bible uses the word season, I think it's talking about a year, but I don't really want to get into why I believe all that. That goes in a whole other direction. But they're in, regardless, they're in jail for a little while. And then they end up dreaming a dream in verse 5, and they dreamed a dream, both of them, each man his dream in one night, each man according to the interpretation of his dream. <clears throat> the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in the prison. And Joseph came in unto them in the morning and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. So they both have these dreams, and they don't understand what they're all about. And they, they're both kind of sad. They don't, they don't get it. Like, why did I have this dream? So Joseph asked him, he's saying, you know, why are you guys sad today? You know, you look, you look different. What's wrong? What's going on? And they both tell him, they say, well, we, you know, we dreamed a dream and there's nobody to give us the interpretation thereof. Now, we see this a lot in the Old Testament where people are given visions and they're given dreams by God. And that's actually one of the ways that God has spoken to people throughout history is using it through dreams. If you remember with Moses, and I don't have the exact reference for this, but when um, Aaron and Miriam we're kind of talking bad about Moses and saying, well, you know, what makes Moses so special? Why, you know, why, why is he the only one that's, you know, supposed to be ruling over the people and everything else? And, you know, Moses real humble and meek. Well, God steps in and he's like, look, with other people, with prophets of the Lord, I speak to them in visions. I speak to them in dreams. But with Moses, I speak to him face to face. That's how special Moses was. Like he wasn't like most of the other, like the vast majority of the other prophets. He's like, Moses is special. Moses is someone, you know, you better watch who you're talking about because he's my friend. He's someone that I talk to face to face. But with other people, he would, you know, go to them in dreams and in visions. And, and this happens a lot throughout the Bible. People would have a dream and, and then know that whatever God was trying to tell them to do or what he wanted them to do. Um, now, obviously, not every dream is of God, so don't go thinking that every dream that you have is something that God's telling you what to do, right? It's not, that's not what I'm saying at all, but it was a way, and there is a lot of reference to, and I looked this up, I didn't really want to get into it a whole lot tonight, of people where, you know, the Bible saying, you know, when someone dreams a dream, and they tell you about it, if that doesn't come to pass, like, that's a false prophet. If someone's saying, God gave me this dream, and this is what it means, everything, and like, it just, like a Joseph Smith, for example, the founder of Mormonism, he's someone that said he had dreams. He's someone that said that he saw these angels, and they told him all this stuff, and he had all these prophecies of events that were going to happen in the near future, in his own lifetime, and none of them came to pass. He was a false prophet. It's, it's evident. Just like with the, the Watchtower organization, right? The Jehovah's Witnesses. They have these people and they, and they would come out with these prophecies and these dreams and they'd say, oh, we have this, you know, and this is going on. I think even today was supposed to be some big event. I, I, I don't know. Like, I haven't been on the internet very much lately. I haven't been on Facebook. You know, I, 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 more and more, I'm just completely staying away from that stuff because it's a bunch of nonsense anyways. It's a big waste of time. But I saw someone, and, and you know, I, I don't know if you guys know the details or not, but so, there's, there's always these things coming, oh, the end of the world's coming, and you know, Jesus could come back, and there's, I think it had something to do with that Planet X and the Nibiru or something, and this is going to kick off the end of the world, and whatever. Look, we don't know when that day is going to no, Anyone that's telling you it's coming on this day, they don't know what they're talking about. And it's not going to come to pass. There's other things that have to happen first. We see that in the Bible. You know, the, the man of perdition has, to, has to, to come into power and stand in the temple where he ought not. The abomination of desolation has to be said. All these things have to happen first. They have to happen because they're in Scripture. This stuff has to happen before the end of the world is going to come, before Jesus Christ comes back. These things have to happen. So that's how I know for a fact, because those things haven't happened yet, I know that I knew last week or whatever that, that not that I even knew people were talking about this, but that today isn't going to be, you know, whatever this major event is that people are claiming it's going to be. Just like when Harold Camping was predicting, you know, the rapture to happen and all these other false prophets are predicting this stuff. Don't let any of that stuff scare you or bother you because that's really all it is. It's a scare tactic and uh, they're false prophets. Anyone telling you, yes, son, you know, just like the 2012 stuff, oh, the Mayan calendar and everything you know, ends there and it's going to be the end of the world and the year 2000, everything's going to crash, there's going to be chaos and the world's going to end. Look, people have been doing this all throughout history and it's really just boils down to a bunch of false prophets. Now, 
are there people that might have dreams about a, about a world cat you know, catastrophe and things happening? That may happen. But just because you have a dream like that doesn't mean that it's from God. And this is, that's the whole point I'm trying to get across here. You know, we read about people who have had dreams and they have had them interpreted and they were like messages, prophetic messages from God. But it does, it's not happening all the time. And remember, when we read the Bible, it's over, it spans courses of like thousands of years. So when you read like three or four events of people having these dreams of, of messages from God, that's happening over thousands of years. So it's not like it's happening all the time. It's not like every single, you know, like, yes, you know, you, you're having dreams from God, you're having dreams from God, I'm having, you know, like, that's not the way it's worked, and that's not the way that the Bible even says that it works. But sometimes there are dreams that come from God. And even in the latter days, the Bible does say that your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall, shall have visions before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And I believe that that is going to happen again. But it's not something that's happening all the time. So I'm just kind of giving that out there as, you know, when you have dreams, like I have weird dreams from time to time. I almost never remember them, but sometimes I just have bizarre dreams. And usually it's just because my mind is processing some things that, that have been going on recently. And it's nothing more than that. But, um, but these guys, they have these dreams. And they seem significant. They're thinking, I don't know what this is. Because it's kind of weird. You know, one guy has the, the baker has the dreams of the birds coming and eating the, the bread out of, you know, it, it has to do with his job and everything else. And they both had similar dreams that were, that were geared towards them individually in the same night. So they're thinking, this is, this is a weird coincidence. This is kind of odd. I wish we had someone who can tell us what these dreams meant. What, it, what is the purpose of this? So Joseph sees this. You know, he asks him, why are they so sad? And he says, okay, well, wait. Look at, uh, look at verse number 8. He says, And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. So he's saying, look, God can give you the interpretations of that. And he's saying, just let, you know, let me know. You know. Tell me what your dreams are. And I'll help with the interpretation that's from God. Um, keep your finger here. Keep a bookmark in Genesis 40. Obviously, we're going to be coming back to it. Flip over, if you would, to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel was another man. We see Joseph is someone himself who has had dreams. We saw that earlier in, the, in, uh, in our studies of Genesis. He had the dreams of his family where you know, his sheaf grew up over all the other ones and, and the other ones bowed down and made obeisance to it. And, and um, he had his own dreams. We see again in the future he's going to also be called upon to, uh, to give the interpretation for Pharaoh's dreams. Well, Daniel was a similar type of person. I, I believe, and I believe this is a gift that's given to, to certain people to be able to interpret dreams. But both Daniel and Joseph, you'll see, they give all the credit unto God. They're saying, look, it's not that I have this great, you know, it's not that Joseph has this great wisdom and he's just super smart and like of his own ability, he's able to provide these interpretations for these guys. It's from God. He, and he even says right here, he says, do not interpretations belong to God. So but tell me, I'll help you out with it. But ultimately, God's the one who gives the interpretation. God's the one where we get the truth from and the meaning from. And in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel's um, right after all of the big books. You've got um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and then you've got Daniel. Daniel chapter 2. And we're going to look at verse, starting verse number 27. Because the king has just asked Daniel to interpret this dream from The king had a dream. And the dream's not important for what, what I'm teaching here. Daniel 2.27. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy better these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. Now, just to give you a little bit of background on this, he had, the, the king had asked, King Nebuchadnezzar had asked for an interpretation, but he forgot the dream himself. Yeah. 
He didn't even know what it was. He, he, had, he woke up with a start and he knew he had this dream and it was real significant and he couldn't even remember what the dream was. So he's asking his magicians. He's asking these false prophets. He's asking the astrologers, the psychics, you know, all these people, hey, I need you to tell me the interpretation of the dream. And they're like, okay, well, tell us what the dream is. He's like, well, that's the thing. I can't tell you the dream. I need you to tell me the dream and the interpretation. They're like, uh, we can't do that. You know, like you, no one has ever asked us to do that. You have to tell us what the dream is and then we give you the interpretation. He says, no. He says, how do I know that what you're going to give me as interpretation is even right? If you can tell me what the dream is, then I'll believe that what you're even going to tell me as the interpretation is right. And he's saying that because he couldn't even remember anyways. But that's what he was demanding. And he got so mad, he was like, okay, we're going to kill all the magicians, astrologers, and all these people. And also Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were kind of lumped in with that group of people that were, that were go gone to for counsel on things like this. So he was going to kill all of them. And Daniel heard about it, and he's like, wait, you know, like, you know, tell the king, you know, well, he can have an interpretation. So Daniel approaches him, and this is what we're, you know, I'm just to give you a little bit more context of what we're reading. And he tells him, look, the astrologers, the magicians, soothsayers, look, they are not going to be able to show this unto you. They can't do that. He says, but there is a God in heaven, the true God. God can reveal secrets. There's a God that knows everything. There is a God that will reveal these secrets unto you. And he says um, in verse number 30, but as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. It's not because I'm so smart of a person. It's not because I have such great skill. It's not because I'm so much better than everybody else. That is not why you're going to get this interpretation. He says, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king and that thou mayest know, mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. He's saying, the reason why I'm even able to do this is because God is giving me this information. God is the one who knows all things. God is the revealer of secrets. He's giving this to me one for, one, for two reasons. One, because for our sakes, that you don't kill us is what he's saying. It's for when he says, and, uh, but for, the, for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king. Because he was demanding the interpretation and if you couldn't give it, he was going to put them all to death. So he was saying, for our sakes, basically, you're going to get this because God's going to protect us and make sure that we don't die because God cared about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they were his servants and doing what was right. And he says, and also that you might know what this dream is all about because the dream did come from God. And he goes and explains what the whole thing means to him. And it's, it's, a, prop, you know, it's a prophetic dream about the future and you know, multiple kingdoms coming and, and, um, and being destroyed and all, and, and all of that. But um, the reason why we turn to Daniel is because Daniel's also someone who's an interpreter of dreams. And when we look in the Bible at people who are interpreters of dreams, don't, you know, don't go to the, to the psychics and the, the tarot card readers and all of these other mystical type of people because there are people out there that will tell you that they'll be able to interpret your dreams for you. But they're into all of this weird mystical stuff. I mean, you go down to Sedona, you'll find it all over the place, and they'll be telling you, oh yeah, I can tell you what your dreams mean, all this other stuff. Look, don't get into that nonsense. Biblically speaking, in the Bible, when we see people interpreting dreams, we've seen it with Joseph, and we see it with Daniel, they're going, they're saying, look, it's not my knowledge, it's completely from God, and, and they are men of God and people who are obeying and, and, and into the Bible. So if anyone's going to interpret any type of dreams, first of all, they better be you know, men of God, that, that to even think about getting an interpretation for a dream, you'd have to be getting it from someone that's getting it directly from God. Okay, so that, 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 that wipes out all of these other people on the, on the court, you know, on, that have these businesses up that are going to tell you that they're psychics and mediums and everything else. And, you know, those, those places are wicked. They are very wicked, and, and we, have a, we have a culture today, and, and I get it, you know, I understand. I, may, I make fun of them too, but we have a culture that kind of just treats it more as a joke, and people will go into these places for fun, and just, oh, okay, yeah, let's go get our horoscope done, you know? And it's just this, this big joke, and a bunch of people will go in, and they'll sit down, and they'll pay the money and say, yeah, whatever, you know, we're just, we just want to do this thing for fun. But honestly, a Christian should never be doing that because God takes that very seriously. With the, the, the punishment for wizards, for witchcraft, for mediums, it's the death penalty. 
in the Old Testament, God gave the death penalty. He says, you should not suffer a witch to live. And wizards and astrologers and prognosticators, necromancers, all these people, they're different names. They might be somewhat older terms used, but it's the same type of people. It's the people that are going to be doing your fortune telling. The people who are going to be doing the psychic thing. Okay? Those people are completely, it's completely wicked. And even joking about it, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't think we should just be, you know, making light and jesting about something that's such a serious sin. There's certain things, you know, that's one of the reasons why homosexuality has gotten so accepted today is because how was it introduced? You know, most normal people, when you hear about a sodomite type of an action, it will turn your stomach. If you were to see two men, you know, kissing or two women kissing or something, about, it's going to turn and revolt you and turn your stomach. Normally, that is the reaction you should have. That is a natural reaction to have to something such so against nature as sodomy, as homosexuality. But what's been happening is through the television, homosexual characters have been introduced slowly over time. And if you think of TV 20, 30 years ago, way different than what's being aired today. Why? Because people will only put up so much. You can't, you can't put, like, if what's on the TV today was aired, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, there would be an uproar. I mean, that, like, whoever was going to put that out would be completely tossed out of business. I mean, there would be so much backlash against that, that, because it would be filthy. People would say, this is disgusting, this is revolting. Don't, you know, what are you trying to do to us? So what they do, they, you know, Satan knows this. So it's an incremental measure. And what they do is they keep pushing the envelope and they push slowly and they keep pushing the line a little bit farther here, a little bit farther. So you get a little bit of blowback. Okay, we go back and then we keep on pushing farther because what it does is it desensitizes you. So they started off with the homosexual character saying, oh, they're just real funny. They're just different. Oh, haha. Ha. You know, this guy comes in, he's real flamboyant and stuff, but he's harmless and everything's just fine. And they don't give you the image that Romans chapter 1 gives you of someone who is a sodomite. They don't give you the image of a predator. And you know what? This used to be common knowledge that the homosexuals are predators, that you have to watch your children around homosexuals because they're out to recruit. And who do they recruit? They recruit, recruit the young children. The defenseless, the people who, you know, the, the don't, don't have enough in them to be able to, to stop the attack, to be able to, you know, to, to not be able to ward off. You know, they, they, they prey on the weak and recruit them in their lifestyle. That's why so many of these people have been abused themselves as children. It's not a shock. It's not a surprise because they've been recruited into that way of thinking and have been perverted and destroyed and defiled. But that's not the image you're presented with. You're, you're presented with an image of saying, oh, ha, 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 it's just funny, it's just a big joke. That's the first, that's just to introduce the characters. That's, it's a part of a plan. You can call me a conspiracy or crazy or whatever. Look, I don't care what you call me. This is the truth. And if you don't believe me, don't believe me. But this is the way you can look back at the way it's been introduced. It's been introduced through sitcoms, through everything else. You have this, every once in a while, you have this guy, and he's not even necessarily a main character. You have these, these weird characters, and, you, and you, you, might, you might not even know that they're, that they're a homo. You just might think that, like, the guy seems kind of off, and he's acting somewhat flamboyant. And then it gets to the point to where, yes, I mean, you remember when, when Ellen DeGenerate came out, and it was a big thing in the late 90s? Like, she came out as being gay, I don't even like using that word gay because gay means happy, but um, it came out that she was a homosexual and like, didn't her show get canceled or something after that? But like, that was huge news and that was only like 15 years ago. And now it's to the point where every, like, like probably, and, and I, don't, I don't keep up with all TV shows, I don't even watch TV anymore, but um, you know, even when I stopped watching TV, it was getting to the point to where there was always, like every sitcom had at least one homosexual character in it. And it's getting to the point, and, and you know, and you hear things, you hear people talking about it, like, then they're doing more, they're just doing more and more things, and they're putting it more in your face. And what it does is it desensitizes. You see it the first time, you're like, oh man, that's nasty. I can't believe they just put that on TV. But then the next time you see it, oh man, it's nasty, but it's not quite as bad. And then the next time you see it, you know, you start getting normalized to it and start thinking, 
It's not that bad anymore because it's just getting pumped into you that this is normal, this is normal, this is normal, this is normal. When in actual, in, in actual fact, I don't know the exact statistics, but it's like one or two, like it's like a few, like a real, 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 real small percentage of the population is, is considered a homosexual. But that's not the way that the TV or movie or anybody would have you think because you always have character. I mean, if it's such a small percentage, why are there so many of these characters being portrayed on the screen? Why? Because there's an agenda, because they're trying to desensitize you to it. And they're pushing it farther and farther and farther to get it normalized for you. And that is, that is honestly what's going on. And we need to guard our minds against the filth and perversion of this world because we don't want to have a, a, not a proper and appropriate reaction to these serious sins. And I just remembered how I got off on this whole trail to bring it back around again was because of the wizards and the witches and the psychics and all this other stuff. It's a similar thing where it's a lot more accepted in our society because it's treated more as like a joke. Because people look at it as just, it's just kind of funny. But it's not funny. If God puts a death penalty on it, just like he does with homosexuality, he puts a death penalty on magicians and astrologers and all that stuff, look, it's not a joke. It's a serious thing. I mean, something that, that you lose your life over doing. That's not a joke. That's not something to be making jokes about. It's not. And we need to, to keep ourselves on track and make sure we have this proper, we need to have a hatred of sin. We have to, to keep us far, far away from it. Because the more you, you tolerate and just get accepting and you don't hate sin, the more likely it's going to be able to creep into your own life. The more likely you're going to be influenced and, and especially maybe around a group of people and they're all going to go do, hey, come on, come on, let's just do this for fun. I know you're a Christian, you know, but like this is, this is just a joke. It's not, it doesn't mean anything anyways. They're not, you know, and people try to, to talk you into doing stuff. And if you don't have the right perspective and the right hatred for yourself, you're going to be a lot more likely to get involved in that. And we need to make sure that we don't get involved in things like that. But let's go back to Genesis. Uh, no, actually, turn if you would to 2 Peter 1. Because there's another point I want to make before we get back into Genesis. Interpretations of dreams belong unto God. Joseph knew this, Daniel knew this, they give God all the credit. And they were, they were people who were gifted, I believe, in being able to, to for God to, to give them this knowledge in order to interpret these dreams for them. But I want to also focus here on it says, do not interpretations belong to God. I don't know how many times people will tell you, you know, like, oh, well, that's just your interpretation of the Bible. That's just your interpretation. The Bible says that, and we're going to turn if you're in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter is almost at the very end of your Bible. If you were going backwards from Revelation, you have Revelation and then the book of Jude, and then 3 John, 2 John, 1 John, and then 2 Peter. So it's all the way almost near the end of the Bible. 2 Peter chapter 1. We'll start reading in... Uh, you know, in context here, Peter's recalling how him and James and John saw, saw Jesus Christ transfigured in the Mount of Olives when they went up with him and they saw Jesus in his glorified body and they saw him talking to Moses and Elijah and, and uh, they saw that vision and came back down. And he was explaining this here in chapter 1, but in verse 19 he says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy. So he's saying, even though we were eyewitnesses to that event, we have a more sure Word of prophecy, more sure than even seeing it with their own eyes. And that's the scripture that we have. The Bible, the scripture is even more sure than seeing something with your own eyes. But um, let's keep reading. Verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. He said, none of the prophecies of Scripture is for your private interpretation. 
It's not something for you just to, to, you know, to figure out and determine, well, what does all this stuff mean? It's given and it's written very clearly. Now, I'm not saying we always understand every word of the scripture, but the Bible is not a book that's supposed to be saying, well, you believe this way and you believe that way, and we all have different interpretations, but that's okay. Because it, there's only one meaning to the words. And God didn't give us a, 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 this mystery to where you know, everything is symbolic and nothing is 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 clear no the way that we interpret the bible and understand the bible it's not a private interpretation it's taking the words for how they're written the face value is always the way that you start off learning god's word now i understand and i and we're going to get into this in genesis chapter 40 there are symbolic references there is a lot of symbol it's a very deep book there's a lot more there however What's written on the surface in those direct black and white words and, the, and the, the first primary meaning for everything is the way it's just spelled out. And if you want to get into some symbolic references, great, but it better match up with everything else that's spelled out very clearly. It can't contradict. If you're looking for symbolic re sim symbolism in the Bible, it cannot contradict anything that's just clearly spelled out. People try to tell you, you know, that, that certain sins are okay and it's not a big deal because of their interpretation of some parable. But the interpretations of the parables that these, you know, and that's where most false doctrine comes from anyways. It's from parables. It's from people trying to come up with their meaning of, well, what did he really meant here was, it's like, no, that's not what he meant. In the vast majority of the parables, you already get an explanation from Jesus anyways, saying, you know, with the, the parable of the sower. Jesus says, well, you know, he that, that the, the seed is the word of God. You know, this is, this is he that, that had the, the seed, you know, received on stony places, and he explains the whole thing. He tells you what it means. There's no room for interpretation there. He tells you exactly what it means. And it means what he says it means. And in the book of Revelation, you know, you, you see these things about the candlesticks and the, and the dragons and all this other stuff. People, I don't understand what that means. He tells you what that stuff means. The vast majority of the stuff he tells you. And if, he, and if the explanation isn't clearly written out there, then whatever your understanding is of those stories better line up with everything else that's clearly written in black and white. And this is the way that we, we interpret or understand the Bible. Because it isn't our own specific interpretation and you, know, you have your interpretation. Look, there's one interpretation and God gives that and he's already given it to us in his, in his words and in his understanding. So we don't, we don't try to, to make, the, because a lot of people out there, they want, they, they want to justify some sin or some action so they'll twist words and try to make it say whatever it is that they want it to say. Now, let's get into some of the sim symbolism of Genesis chapter 40. As I mentioned in earlier chapters, Joseph is a type of Jesus. He's a, he has a lot of things with Joseph is foreshadowing the events of Jesus Christ. Um, in this chapter, with these dreams, some of the symbolism that's for foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, first of all, the dreams, even though they were the butler and the baker, their dreams had to do with what? Wine being pressed into Pharaoh's cup and bread from the baker, right? These were the two things. And Jesus Christ, his blood was the one that brought life. And remember, the, the butler is the one who had his life spared. He had life granted to him. And his, the symbolism in his dream was the, was the grapes or the, or the blood of Christ. And then the, the baker had the bread, which was the flesh that was broken for us. And the, and the bakers died. But even more, I think, you know, important than that is, think about this. Joseph is in the prison with both of these men. Remember, Jesus was numbered with the transgressors. When Jesus was crucified, how many people were there in total that was receiving condemnation with Jesus Christ? There was three total, right? Jesus and then two thieves, one on either side of him. And what happened with those two thieves? Well, we'll read in uh, Luke chapter 23. Because in this, in this story, in Genesis 40, what happens? One guy is saved and gets life. The other person receives death. Well, it's the same thing when Jesus was crucified next to those two thieves. One guy gets saved and the other one does not. In Luke 23, verse 39, the Bible reads, And one of the malefactors which were hanged 
railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God? seeing thou art in the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. So here we see that one thief calling on the name of the Lord. He's calling on Jesus Christ. Now, he doesn't say, you know, Jesus save me, but he says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. That's good enough for God. He was believing on Christ. He was acknowledging here, look, he didn't do anything wrong. He's not a sinner like we are. He says, we deserve this punishment, but he does not. And he's recognizing Jesus for who he is and putting his faith on him and saying, you know, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom, showing that he believed that he was the Christ because he's saying, when you come into your kingdom, he believed on Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus answers him in verse 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. It's a foreshadowing event here in Genesis chapter 40. One, one prisoner was executed, the other one was freed. It's the same exact thing that happened. Joseph is that's a, it's a great illustration, example of what happened um, with Jesus Christ. Now, the last point I want to make here is look at, uh, you know, after, after the butler is freed, right? And but, well, before he's even out of prison, Joseph interprets the dream to him. He says, look, remember, you know, he's like, uh, let's just read it real quick. Because um, he gives him the interpretation. He says, yep, you're going to be restored back to your position. And in verse 14, he says, but think on me. When it shall be well with thee, and show kindness, I pray thee unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For indeed, I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also have I done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. So he's saying, look, this is good for you. This is great news. You're going to be out of here. You're going to have your job. So when you get out of here, remember me. He said, I, I'm not even supposed to be here. I was stolen out of the land of the Hebrews. I was taken captive and brought here and sold into slavery. And I haven't even done anything since I've been here to be in prison. I'm wrongfully accused. Remember me and speak unto Pharaoh for me. Let Pharaoh know about me and who I am. I just helped you out. I gave you this great interpretation for your dream. But what happens? He forgets about him. It says in verse 23 at the very end of the chapter, he says, Ye did not, Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forget him. And this is something that, that we need to keep in mind as we go through our trials. Because obviously it's a real bad thing for the, for the butler to be going through at that time. He was in a real bad place and he needed help. And Joseph was there to help him. But he forget him. I mean, what, he, he's excited. You know, I'm sure when he was released from prison, he'd been in there for a long time and he gets his job back and he's put right back into his position. And he's like, yes, this is awesome. And just completely forgets about poor Joseph. Because, hey, everything's going great for me. And we need to make sure that we maintain this attitude. And we're not going to go back to, to Genesis. So turn, if you would, to Matthew 25. We need to make sure that we can maintain an attitude where we're thinking not just about ourselves, we're thinking about other people. Because oftentimes when you go through low points, you'll have somebody there to help you out. And we ought never forget those people that help us out. But this is the, the verse that I, what came to mind first of all when I, when I read this story about Joseph being in prison and asking not to be forgotten. Don't forget about me in prison. Matthew 25, look at verse number 34. This was Jesus speaking. He says, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, 
Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. One of the things that we as Christians ought to be doing is thinking about other people in these types of positions. Look, he's talking about people who have it bad, who have it rough, people who don't have clothing, people who don't have food, people who are sick, people who are in prison. Don't forget about those people. On the contrary, you ought to be helping them out, visiting them. Visit people in prison. Visit, you know, visit the, the, the saved men that are in Christian, you know, your brothers in Christ that are in prison. Visit the, the, the people who are sick and, and help them out. And this is what he's saying. Look, because they're, they're saying, wait, we didn't do this to you, Jesus. You know, like, like we never saw you in these conditions. He says, and as much as you've done it to the least, to the, to the least of the people, you've done it unto me. And this is, this is something that we need to remember. And this is one of the good things. And this is one of the blessings that I had when I used to run a, a nursing home ministry. Because you go and you visit people who are forgotten, for the most part, by almost everybody else. Especially the one that I was at. There was, I mean, there was very little family members coming to these people. And, uh, and they were in really poor conditions. And this is something that I encourage you to go out and be a part of yourself in whatever capacity. If you're thinking, I don't know what more I can do for God. I don't know what ways I can help and be an impact. Hey, here's one of the ways you can do it. Start visiting people. Start visiting. There's a lot of, there's a lot of old folks in this, in this town and in the community. It's, it's more of a retirement type of a community anyways. There are nursing homes and there are people you could go in and visit. And if you want help with starting and doing something like that, let me know. I will help you out as much as possible. But visit the, visit the, the, the sick. Visit, the, you know, visit these people. Um, it's, it's, it's a great thing to do. It's something that we ought to do. Jesus said, if you do it unto the least of these, it's like you're doing it unto me. And especially when it's a brother or sister in Christ. When it's, when it's someone that's... Uh, that's part of the thing. That's why it says, um, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren. It's one of Jesus Christ is someone who's born again. You've done it unto me. Now, um, turn if you would then to Luke chapter 17. Last place we'll turn. We're almost done. Luke 17. Because this, this concept and idea, when, when things go well for us after things have just gone really bad, we get so focused and so happy about being past that rough time that it's easy to have a tendency to forget the, the people that helped you out. And um, we need to make sure that that doesn't happen in our situations and that we can still you know, properly recognize and give thanks and, and you know, maybe turn around and do, do the same thing for other people that... that you've had done for you and I know we've had tremendous amount of health uh, or help with things and in the last church that we were in and you know different things that we've struggled with and we haven't really gone through much here thankfully but um, you know I know I'm confident that the people in here in this room and in, in our church are, are very willing and always ready to, to help one another out and I'm thankful for that I think it's a it's a great church and, and I know that, um, that people are there for us. So let's not, let's all of us then make sure that we don't forget when people are there to help us out. Look at Luke 17 because this happened with, even to Jesus. In verse number 12, uh, the Bible reads, And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? One per he, he, there were ten lepers that were asking Jesus for help. And Jesus healed all of them. But only one person had the gratitude, had, had the thought to go back and just say, thank you. Praise God. Thank you for healing me. Thank you for cleansing me. But this is oftentimes the way that it is. And, you know, we get knocked for doing the soul winning that we do. And people will give us a hard time and say, oh, well, if you're getting this many people saved, you know, you look at the bulletin and it says there's over 50 people saved. Oh, well, what, then how come you don't have 50 people more in your church? Where are they? Well, and what they'll try to say is that they must not have gotten saved then if they're not coming to your church. Well, where are they? 
Well, did Jesus not cleanse ten lepers here? Did he not completely heal them and clean them? Because they didn't all come back and say thank you and do what was right, does that mean that they just weren't healed at all? Of course not. That's ridiculous. Jesus knows he cleansed all ten. That's what the Bible says he cleansed all ten. Only one of those people came back and, and gave God thanks and gave glory unto God. The rest went their way, but they were still healed. And it's the same way with the soul winning. You know, we go out and we get people saved. And look, getting saved is easy. Putting your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ is easy. Having a character to come to church and to start getting right with God and do all these other things, that's a little bit more difficult. It doesn't mean because they don't do all these things that they're not saved. I didn't go to church right away after I got saved. There was all kinds of period of time. I didn't even get baptized for like seven years after I got saved. It doesn't mean I wasn't saved. It just means I was living in the flesh. So don't let people try to discourage you about the soul winning efforts that we do. It's like, oh, well, these people aren't really getting, if they're really getting saved, they'd be in church. And you know what? The people who say that are the ones who say, you have to repent of all of your sins and you have, to, you have to live a righteous life. And if you're drinking, you're not saved and all this other nonsense. And they're looking at the works. And the works are not what gets you saved. So don't let these people fool you or deceive you. This happened to Jesus Christ and we saw it even it happened to Joseph in jail too. That, the, that he was forgotten about. Even though that he had treated them well and done what was right. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you for the, for the great lessons that we could learn through these chapters, dear Lord. And um, Lord, we thank you for having such a, such a deep book where there is so, much, so many symbolic references to Christ and that truly the, the whole theme and, and we can find Christ all over the place in the Bible, dear Lord, um, if we're, if we're looking at it appro appropriately, dear Lord, and we thank you so much for loving us and for giving us that gift of salvation, dear Lord, and help us not to be uh, forgetful hearers, but doers of the work, and help us also, dear Lord, not to forget the people who have helped us out in our times of need and trouble, but that we would um, be able to recognize the help that we've given and also that we would give, be helpful and be a blessing to other people during their times of need, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.